I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. This week, we're talking to the scientist growing new brain cells for people with Parkinson's disease and also the man who's recreating human organs in a test tube. Plus, evidence that antibiotics in pregnancy could affect the behaviour of a baby, why air travel is destined to become bumpier in the future, and is it true that it only takes one hit to get hooked on heroin? Hello, I'm Chris Smith. You're listening to BBC Radio Cambridgeshire, and this is The Naked Scientist. Now, we've seen many recent extreme weather events, from mudslides in Colombia to flooding in Australia, which scientists say are a consequence of climate change. But it's not just the weather that gets affected. The Earth's atmosphere is made up of several layers of air, and they all flow around each other in patterns known as jet streams, and an increase in temperature is going to cause those to speed up. Now, this is very bad news for air passengers, including the one million people who are currently airborne at this very instant up there above us, because an increase in the speed of the jet stream will cause more turbulence, and that's going to make flying less comfortable and potentially a lot more dangerous. Tom Crawford heard how it's happening from atmospheric scientist Paul Williams. We've been looking at turbulence over the Atlantic Ocean and specifically severe turbulence, uh, which is strong enough to hospitalise people and indeed it does cause many serious injuries every year. Um, What we've been interested in specifically is the impact that climate change might be having on severe turbulence. We can expect a 59% increase in light turbulence, 94% increase in moderate turbulence and 149% increase in severe turbulence. And that, of course, means we're looking at twice or maybe even up to three times as much severe turbulence as there has been historically. So you gave us an example of severe turbulence sort of saying you know this can injure people but most of us will have only experienced I imagine probably light or moderate turbulence sort of the shaking feeling when your flight starts bobbing around a bit. So so what do you mean you know is there a turbulence scale? There is. Um, Scientists have developed a scale much in the same way that we have the Richter scale for measuring the strength of earthquakes, um, that we do have a scale for measuring the strength of turbulence. It doesn't have a name, um, but it's a seven-point scale in which one means light turbulence, three means moderate, five means severe, and seven means extreme. So just to put some definitions there, in light turbulence which anyone virtually who's flown will have experienced. There's just a slight strain against the seatbelts. Certainly food service would be able to continue and people would be able to walk around the cabin without difficulty in light turbulence. Let's turn the notch up to moderate turbulence. Now there's a definite strain against seatbelts, unsecured objects certainly being dislodged, walking difficult, flight attendants instructed to take their seats. And now let's move up to severe turbulence. This, by definition, is stronger than gravity. So passengers will be forced violently against their seatbelts. Food surface and walking are certainly impossible. And because it's stronger than gravity, any unbuckled passengers and crew will potentially be catapulted around inside the cabin. So it's this severe turbulence that really hospitalises people. And it's the, it's, the, it's the kind of turbulence that is not just an issue about comfort, but about safety. Okay, so we've talked a lot about turbulence and how it, you know, as you've said, it's going to increase in the in the atmosphere because of climate change. So how is that going to happen? How does turbulence form? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. What it all boils down to is something that meteorologists refer to as a wind shear. Um, And that's a complicated term, but it means something very simple, which is simply the fact that the higher up you go in the atmosphere, the windier it gets. So, for example, anyone who's ever climbed up the Eiffel Tower will know that when you're at ground level, it's usually not very windy. And by the time you're about halfway up, usually it's getting quite windy by that stage. But certainly by the time you reach the top of the Eiffel Tower, usually the wind is blowing very strongly. And that's a wind shear. And in fact, we know that this effect, the increase of wind speed with altitude takes place from ground level, not only up to the top of the Eiffel Tower, but beyond, all the way up to many kilometres, maybe 10 kilometres high, to form the jet stream. And it's instabilities within those wind shears that generate turbulence. In simple terms, what climate change is doing is that it's not warming the atmosphere uniformly. The different parts of the atmosphere are warming by different amounts. And specifically, at 30 to 40,000 feet, where planes tend to have their cruising altitudes, the low-latitude tropical regions 
are warming more than the high latitude Arctic regions. And so the temperature difference, the north south temperature difference across the Atlantic Ocean, is becoming stronger because of climate change. And it's that temperature difference that drives the jet stream. And as it becomes stronger, the jet stream is becoming stronger, the wind shears are becoming stronger. And that's the physical mechanism by which climate change is driving stronger and more frequent turbulence. And just with everything we've discussed, it almost seems to me like this this could be the the first sort of real life experience of climate change affecting people now. Yes, for some people, maybe focused in the developed world, this might be one of the most obvious um, early signs of climate change. Of course, that's not true for, for people in the developing world where the impacts are much more serious in many ways about um, heat stress and crop failure and flooding, etc., sea level rise. But for some people in the developed world, especially frequent flyers who, of course, make a contribution to climate change through aviation's emissions, this effect might be um, one of the early signs of climate change. And of course, for some people, it might even be the thing that pushes them into actually caring about climate change in the first place and maybe taking actions to minimise their carbon footprint. Sobering thought, isn't it? That was Dr Paul Williams from the University of Reading and his study was published in the journal Advances in Atmospheric Sciences. He was speaking with Tom Crawford. This is BBC Radio Cambridgeshire.